Good morning. How are you all this morning? There's more and more of you every week, but we're still socially distanced, just for those of you watching at home. <laughs> um, and hello to those of you that are watching at home this morning, whether you're live or watching us later. So good morning um, on behalf of Elmsdale Cooperative Ministry here at Riverview United Church this morning, and I am your minister, Reverend Kim Curlett, and I think I know all of you, but I might not know of all of you, so good morning to you. I'm going to invite Gary Smiley, our chair of the board here at Riverview United Church, to come up and give us our morning announcements. Always helps to turn the mic on. Morning, everyone. And as usual, you look fantastic. Unreal. Those masks add so much color. Ah, unreal. Anyway, uh, just a couple of announcements. Number one, we have a meeting tomorrow night for the uh, stewards, and we're going to be going over our plans for our supper takeout, uh, which will be held on the 13th of February. So anyone that wants to show up for that, we're going to go over what we're gonna, our plan is to do it. Um, one another announcement here, which is very important because the UCW turned around the right way. UCW is having a soup challenge fundraiser. Starts tomorrow, Monday, the 1st of February, and ends Sunday, February the 28th. Everyone is welcome to take part, and it's so easy. Uh, if for, it, here it is. For every bowl of soup that you have during February, put a loony in a cup. So every time you have a bowl of soup, take a loony, put it in a cup. Or if you want to put 5 or $10 in it, fine. And then put your donation in an envelope marked UCW and place it in the offering plate on February the 28th. Or, if you want to, it says here, send a check for $100 to Mabel Wellwood. <laughs> oh, it doesn't say that. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Mabel Wellwood, 21 Garden Road, Bell Nan, B2S. 2N4. That is also in our uh, weekly announcements uh, newsletter that you online would have gotten yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other just little things. We have your uh, annual um, contribution receipt out here in the narthex. So if uh, anyone here knows someone that's not here and you could take it up, pick it up and take it to them, it will save us some uh, postage. So uh, anyone that you know and anyone outside that's listening and can't make it and you have a friend that maybe could pick it up for you, give them a call and ask them if they would pick it up. Okay, thank you. So just to add to Gary's announcements this morning, who is receiving your email newsletter? Yeah, good. What happened? So you might, some of you might have got an email newsletter that said, uh, we miss you. So I noticed that we went from 110 emails to about uh, 68. And I thought, did that many people unfriend me? I was really offended. But then I realized that what the system does is you may see your email come in, but if you don't open it, eventually it bumps you into an inactive file. And so what it had done was only showing me the active file. So if a, a newsletter wasn't open for a couple of weeks, it just kind of put everybody in there so we're not spamming people. So now I'm sending it to everybody. But to keep yourself moving, just make sure you click on it and have a read each week. Um, and so they're there, but if you don't get it in your um, email newsletter or you miss it somehow, by, uh, by Tuesday, the one from Saturday will be up on the website, too, under newsletters. So they're all archived there. So if you go to elmsdalecooperativeministry.com and go to newsletters, they're all there. So you can go back and look at any of the ones that you might want to look at to find Mabel's address, uh, to send in your money, um, or any other information that you're looking for. That also has the weekly order of service if it's something you want to look at in advance. It has all the scriptures that are recommended for the week. And it also, in that order of service, has the link to all of the videos that we show. So as you're looking through the order of service, if you want to actually watch those videos again at home, the music that we play, you can find them in your uh, weekly order of service too. That's 
in the newsletter and also under the worship tab. So go have a look, get to know our, our website. You can't mess it up. Only I can do that from my end. So you clicking around and looking and finding what's there um, will just get you more familiar with what, what we have going and there'll be more added to it in the coming year. Uh, the other announcement I have is after s Sunday morning last week, I was in my office and I looked at my wall calendar and I almost cried because I saw I had pre-booked a week of continuing education that I didn't know that I had, and I'm so darn tired, I was so excited. So I have a week coming up, a week off, and so I'll be using that week um, to spread out the Lent and Easter planning that I've been trying to pack all in, so I'll have a whole week to do that. I also have been um, part of the Calvin Symposium on Worship and haven't really had the time to watch all of the videos and workshops that they have, but I have that as well. So that's what I'm going to be working on from February the 8th to February the 14th. So on Sunday, that's Valentine's Day, um, you'll still have church just like you normally do, and you'll have one extra video, and guess what it will be? My sermon! So I'm going to record it in advance so you won't miss anything. And we don't need pulpit supply, and we don't. And Maggie uh, will set everything up like she always does. And next week, Maggie, we're going to run the PowerPoint through your computer and make sure it all works. And yeah, so it will, it will be like I'm, I'm not even here. You don't even need me anymore, really. Just, you know, oh, anyway. You do need me to record it in advance. So that will be all taken care of for February 14th, and then I'll be back uh, in my office at home and on the on the 15th and we'll see you again in person on the 22nd so i will be here next week i'll be here on the 7th um but just to kind of give you a heads up i'll be i'll be wait linton world who's the student minister and a longtime um chaplain for the united church of canada will be our emergency pastoral care he's in rodden he's actually in gore but he works for rodden united church so he'll be our emergency pastoral care that week and i'll make sure you have all that information and you and where's the other one i saw ann and ann <laughs> you guys will all have that information so welcome to ann this morning as nine mile river folk any other nine mile river folks here well eunice and eunice and uh that guy dave um <laughs> eunice and her husband they're half time at nine mile river good morning dave <laughs> so as we gather this morning let us acknowledge that we are in this region where we live and we work and we worship. We are on lands that are by law the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. We say together, Amsit Nogama, all my relations. We are all treaty people. And as we light our Christ candle as a symbol for the light of Christ with us in worship today, I'm going to invite you to stand and we'll say our new creed together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Remain standing for our call to worship. As people, as a group, as a community of faith, we gather in this place to listen, speak, to worship, to pray, to be with God. Because we know it is out of God's authority, it is out of God's love that we live. Alleluia. Please be seated. Let us pray our opening prayer. Speak with authority in our lives, dear Christ. Speak to us and to what is in us so that we might be whole. Speak to us with love, with hope, with strength so that we might hear you and know that deep inside we are all your people and that you are our God. 
let it be so. Our opening hymn this morning is Out of the Depths. Our hymns are from Voices United and More Voices this morning. Out of the Depths, O God. You'll see the words on the screen so you can follow along, but please don't sing. We're not allowed to yet. Um, and it's from 611. We come now to our time of prayer, our prayer of confession, our prayer of reconciliation, our time of turning our hearts back to God. You'll see on the screen the prayer that I'll be saying. There's no part for you to say today, but there'll be a section that will have something like, what are some of the ways? And you know how sometimes at the end of our prayer of reconciliation, we have a time of silence? Instead, we have it scattered through our prayer today. Let us pray. O oh, divine healer, we confess that sometimes we yearn for you to wave a magic wand on our wounded lives, to remove our pain, illness, and suffering. We hear the gospel story of the one seeking healing from Jesus and assume you will perform a similar miracle for all of us if we just pray hard enough. And we do pray. Open our eyes to recognize the teachings and tools you have given us with which to seek healing in the midst of our afflictions and diseases. You whisper to us that wholeness requires self-care and rest. You nudge us toward caregivers who can support and advise us. In silence, let us consider who may help us. You breathe into us energy to move and stretch and reach toward health. In silence, let us consider some ways to do this.
You place in us an urgency to seek justice so that all may enjoy adequate health care. In silence, consider some actions we might take. Renew our spirits in the midst of our diseases and afflicting spirits. Transform us, O Holy One, for the health of your creation. And all God's people said, Amen. And in the midst of disease and affliction and struggles, know that we are all made in God's image and God is always there to see us become whole and good. So let us celebrate this morning the God that is indeed in our midst through the opportunities of wholeness and justice that present themselves to us in the week following our prayers today. I'm going to invite, who did I give scripture to? Ah, Margaret. I'm going to invite Margaret to come forward. I have a prayer of illumination that we'll say once she gets here. While she comes to the mic, I'll take this opportunity to thank the worship team this morning, to thank Maggie and Debbie and Martha and Margaret, Gary. Are we ready? Good. And everybody, actually, and thank you to all of you that helped to keep us safe every Sunday as well. The back to the church committee and team that do all the work and are arriving here right at 9 o'clock um, every Sunday to make sure that we're all got our hands washed and we're all logged in and all of that stuff. So a special thanks to all of you this morning. Let us pray. Unstop our ears, O God, that we may hear your word proclaimed this day. Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Free us from the unclean spirits of worry, fear, destruction, and pride. Teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Our first reading. First reading is from Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. And the responsive reading is from Psalm 111. Praise for God's wonderful works. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are, Great the, are works the works of the Lord, of the Lord studied, studied by all, all who, who delight, delight in them. them. Full of honor and majesty is God's work, and God's righteousness endures forever. God, God has, has gained, gained renown, renown by their, their wonderful deeds. deeds. The, the Lord, Lord is gracious and merciful. God provides food for those who fear them. They are ever mindful of their covenant. God, God has shown their people the power of their, of their works in giving them the heritage, heritage of the nations. Of the nations. The works of God's hands are faithful and just. All God's precepts are trustworthy. They are, they are established, established forever and ever, and ever to be performed, performed with faithfulness and uprightness. God sent redemption to the people. God has commanded this covenant forever. Holy, Holy and, and awesome, awesome is God's, God's name. name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. 
God's praise endures forever. And our reading from the Gospel is the Gospel of Mark, continuing where we left off from last week. This is the story of the man and the unclean spirit, reading from Mark 1, 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God add to our understanding the reading of this and all of our holy scriptures this morning. Amen. Our music is another piece from Voices United. It's number 609. It'll be sung for us. Our music is a little more solemn this morning. We're thinking about demons and exorcism and all kinds of exciting things this morning. I didn't want to get you too riled up, so I thought I'd ease you in with some nice music. But In All Our Grief and Fear is the song that we will listen to um, before our reflection.
Please pray with me. Holy One, let the words that I share reach the hearts that need to hear them. Let the thoughts that I share inspire us all to think on you when we go from this place. And God, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. May we all experience your peace this day and evermore. Amen. So the gospel, these uh, few weeks before Lent, as I mentioned last week, are going to focus on the gospel of Mark. So the first book of the gospel of Mark, and I gave you the, the update up until there. If you missed it last week, you can find the video online under the worship tab at elmsdalecooperativeministry.com. It's always the good plug, right? But you can always go back. If you just need to hear that sermon again, they're always there. But I did. I gave you the update. I kind of told you how Mark, the book of Mark started, and we saw the baptism of John. We had 40 days in the desert that only took two verses. And then last week, do you remember what story we heard? We heard that Jesus came to the fishermen and said, follow me. And what did they do? Drop their nets, followed him. So today's story, um, today's story leads off from there. You know, he was called, he called folks to leave everything they knew behind and to follow him into what was unknown and what was uncomfortable. And Mark's gospel doesn't begin with the birth, of narr uh, the birth narrative of Jesus like Mark and, nope, Matthew and, uh, and Luke do, right? He begins right here, right at the beginning of Christ's ministry in the world. Here on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, this is where Mark begins, and this is where the ministry of Jesus begins. So here we are in the seaside city of Capernaum today. They left their nets, they followed him, and they made their way to Capernaum, which was the city by the sea. Jesus entered the, uh, the uh, temple on the Sabbath, and he began to teach right away. He hadn't done that before. He'd listened. He had taken part in, in um, listening to the teachings of the rabbis in the temple. But this is what he does. He just marches in like he owns the place. He begins to teach. Now, the scribes were the authority on the teaching, the authority given to them by religious leaders to teach in the temple. But, you know, too often the scribes were so busy spelling out the letter of the law that they ignored the spirit behind it. The original laws of Moses that scribes were responsible for writing over and over again and translating and interpreting eventually became contaminated with man-made rules and regulations and traditions that kind of snuck their way into the writing. You know, humans like to make things as humans do. In many ways, the regulations and traditions held people in the control of other people, in the control of their leaders. These rules of man often seem to become more important than the law of God. God's law was and always is, and let us never forget it, about helping to guide us onto God's intended path of peace passion, love for one another and God. Jesus, the word of God made flesh, came not to abolish the laws of Moses, but rather to hold up and remind the folks of the original intention of the law of God. Those laws that were meant to free us and not control us. Control has always been the desire of man woman, people. Yeah, I have some control issues too, it's true. We all do. But God, on the other hand, God gave us free will because God never desired to control us. Isn't that interesting? So we think about these laws sometimes as being onerous and, and commanding over us. But if we look at the laws of God, they're always about keeping one another safe, 
about taking care of each other, about honoring one another. God's laws desire nothing from us but to love one another and to love God. So we read today about Jesus' first act of public ministry, teaching in the temple, teaching with authority. You know, he was really impressive. People noticed him right away, and there would have been all kinds of people trying to teach in there, but he was the one they paid attention to. While this part is not the arc of the story, it's important as the beginning of the story because Jesus is noticed. And he is not just noticed by the people listening, but who do you think he's also noticed by? The leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. He is noticed. And, you know, he does have this air of authority about him. And that is going to make them a little uncomfortable. Up until now, they've had control. That moment, this beginning of the Gospel of Mark, sets the tone for what's to come and sets the tone for what we see happen on Good Friday. Spoiler alert. The arc of today's story, though, is the exorcism of the demoniac. I met Martha this morning and I had forgotten to send her the sermon because I sometimes send it to her in advance and she gives it a read and figures out what music she might like to play. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to send that to you this morning, Martha. Don't worry, it's just about exorcism and demons. Roll with it. She's going to play the theme from The Exorcist. <laughs> we could take the story today literally, right? We could take it like the demons and the exorcist. We could think about it in that kind of way. What the modern um, interpreter often does, though, is try and take it and make it make sense to us in our modern ways of thinking. We always want to make everything make sense, don't we? And so we might interpret it as somehow Jesus healing someone from uh, schizophrenia or epilepsy, and that's the demon. But I'm not going to do that today either. I'm sure you've heard that one before. What I would like to think about the story today as is a parable. So this story in itself as a parable. And what do parables do? Parables are stories that Jesus told over and over again to teach us something about the kingdom of God, warn us about something about the kingdom of earth, or do a little bit of both. So let's have a look at the story from that perspective this morning. So while Mark, the writer of Mark, he may not be as detailed as Matthew. Matthew goes on and on and on and on. Matthew and I are a lot alike. He might not be as eloquent as Luke. Luke loses a lot of flowery language. But what Mark does, if you read that book, Mark is always succinct and deliberate in his words. And so this story, there's no mistake why this story is where it is in the the whole passage of the narrative of Jesus. Jesus is teaching, people are impressed, someone in the crowd calls out, and we're told the person has an evil spirit, and the spirit says, the spirit speaks directly to Jesus and says, What have you to do with us? Jesus of Nazareth names him. Nobody else knows who this guy is yet. The spirit names him. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And in the book of Mark, Jesus doesn't like to bring attention to himself. He doesn't like people going out and telling everybody about him doing uh, Savior stuff and him being the Messiah. And again and again, he tells people when he heals them, go and tell no one. Just live a good life. He's more interested in showing people the kingdom of God than he is about telling them about it. So, the moment that he sets all of that up for what's happening in the rest of the mark, all of this, you guys be quiet business, starts right here. He says, shh, silence. Come out of this man. And he has authority. The spirit hears him. What does he do? Do you hear it? He shakes the man. (laughs) Shakes him. Like, just shakes him silly, because he doesn't want to go. That demon, the demons inside of us, they don't want to leave. They're really comfy. We kind of like them sometimes, too, because we know them. 
but eventually it leaves. And when that happens, not only does it shake that one man, it shakes the whole group of people watching. It shakes them to their very core. They say, what's this? What's this teaching? It's teaching with authority. Not only has he told us, he has shown us. Even the spirits listen to him and obey. And then that news, I mean, that's a hard one to keep secret, isn't it? You know, eh, there was an exorcism there at Riverside United Church this morning. Shh, don't tell anybody. I think that would get around here. That would be right on East Hans wants to know. Gary would have it on the sign. It would be everywhere. The news about that spread. That was a healing moment. If we think about the story as a parable, we want to look about look to the parable about the part that doesn't really make sense to our listening ear. That's how you begin to understand a parable. You look for the part that doesn't make sense. That's going to give you a hint on what the parable is all about. So why does the story of the demoniac, the person possessed by a demon, screaming from the temple, fall immediately after the people are amazed by Jesus' teaching? Ched Myers, who I introduced you to last week, who's written the, the book on um, radical discipleship and written a book about the Gospel of Mark, he tells us that this part of the story is put in here to teach us something. And it teaches us this. These are Ched Meyer's words. Jesus' kingdom project, that is the teachings that he's about to embark on, his ministry, which uh, Myers calls Jesus' kingdom project, is incompatible with local public authorities and the social order they represent. God's kingdom is a flip version of the kingdom of the world. Every person present in that temple that day was used to the way that things had always been done. The ways, the rules, the traditions, the ways had always been followed because they'd been taught to them by the religious leaders, by the scribes, as the very word of God. Rules and regulations, traditions became taught as the rule of God. But then along comes Jesus, the word of God made flesh. And he starts teaching people that the point of the Sabbath is not to sit back and do nothing, to not work at all as they had been taught. They had been taught that even healing on the Sabbath was against the law of God. Jesus comes and not only does he heal on the Sabbath, he teaches them about, you know, the Sabbath is to be made holy. But he says that you are to put away the work of the world right, to do all of the things that might, um, you know, fill our own pockets or give us more prestige, and use a time, a set-aside time, that's a Sabbath, a set-aside time to do only the work of God. Again and again, Jesus will show the law of God what it really means rather than tell the people. He heals this man on the Sabbath, and he will heal more on the Sabbath in the temple. He will also eat and commune with people that have been under the law unclean. He will speak up against every policy, every procedure, every tradition that oppresses and enslaves God's people and keeps them from loving God and one another. Because this is against everything that God is for. But Jesus teaching those things is against everything the religious powers have built, and it puts Jesus and all who follow him in danger. When Jesus silences the demon and calls it out of the man, he calls on all of our demons to be silenced. He calls on every dark thing within each and every one of us that keeps us from being in relationship with God and with one another. Dr. Osvaldo Vena wrote a commentary that I read this week on workingpreacher.org. And he said, naming the demons is a way to recognize that they exist. Just like the demon naming Jesus of Nazareth 
recognize that Jesus existed. Naming our demons is how we begin to call them out. Venna says that those demons begin with unbelief. This is a quote. Unbelief, losing one's faith in God, in life as a sacred force, and in our fellow human beings. It is the feeling that nothing can be done to solve our problems. Then, springing from that one, that sense of unbelief, comes the others in fearful company. Homophobia, racism, sexism, classism, religious and ideological intolerance, violence at home and at school, poverty, militarism, terrorism, war, greed, extreme individualism, globalization, out-of-control capitalism, media-infused fear that leads to paranoia, and governmental manipulation of information, just to name a few. Demons, indeed. Jesus, the Word made flesh, has the authority to both teach us how to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and to help us to call those demons that keep us from it. Like the scribes who work, the scribes whose work eventually led people further away from God than closer to it, Jesus is working to flip that around and bring people closer to the kingdom than farther from it. We, like them, though, have deeply ingrained beliefs and traditions about how this world works that keep us somehow from loving each other. The anything that teaches us that someone else isn't worthy of love, isn't worthy of our love, let someone else love them is not the solution, is what keeps us from God. And Jesus came to lift the darkness within each and every one of us so that God's light can shine as a beacon of hope, a beacon of love in this world. That's the kind of healing that this world needs right now, don't you think? So listen, Jesus is saying to those demons inside each and every one of us today, those that are screaming against everything that Jesus represents because they know there is no room for them, when we're following God. We are calling them to come out of us, to leave us. And on the way out, my friends, I'm sorry, but they are going to shake the out of you. They are going to rattle your nerves because what you know, what your deepest held beliefs that keep you from loving one another fully and loving God are in your bones. But it's time shake them out and when you do people will be shaken by your presence people will see you and wonder whoa how can they love like that i want to know that and by modeling that kind of love in the world confidently sharing love itself the love that is radical discipleship, the love that is God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we are called to do. God's kingdom requires all of us to resist our demons that don't want us to believe in that love at all. This love will change the whole world if we let it. This love is the true authority on our lives, and what does not lead to this love ought not to have any power over us anymore. Amen? Amen. Shake. Go ahead and raise that hand.
Amen. Thanks, Martha. We have a video from uh, Called to Be the Church series, which is um, a stewardship program from the United Church of Canada. Um, we may be interested in working with this program in the spring, and so I've started to show the videos that a smaller group would work with together. And today's video is about a group that is thinking about um, how to be generous. Um, keep in mind this was filmed before COVID, so you won't see masks on folks and those things. Sometimes, uh, do you guys find that now when you watch a show or something? You think, oh my goodness, they're so close together. <laughs> um, so you'll see that here, but um, this is going to end. And so we need to think uh, what we can share in this world. So are you ready, Maggie? Awesome. Let's go. Hi there, I'm Christopher Levan, and I wanted to invite you into my church kitchen to bake up a batch of gratitude. <laughs> now you're, you're going to tell me that you can't make people generous. Don't force it. And you're right. You're probably also going to remind me that my theological training points me towards loftier pursuits. Uh, how do we put it now? Yes, word, sacrament, and pastoral care. But here's the deal. In this time and in this place, as disciples, we have no greater task than creating a community that is shaped by the spirit of generosity. I mean, we're no longer the big institution, the social agency of choice, the chaplain to empire. We're, we're small, marginalized, and, and that's our gift. We can grow the community from the ground up, so to speak. And that's why I want to make a pitch for the kitchen, because it is in this place that we can literally preach the good news. I mean, you hand someone a fresh baked bun and out of their mouth before they even know it is the word thank you. Generosity grows from common delight as we share in God's grace. If you want to love your neighbor, give them a slice of fresh homemade pizza. Food without condition and without price, as the prophet Isaiah says. We do that twice a month here in this kitchen. Sometimes we think that the church begins and ends on a Sunday morning. The people that are important are the ones who are in the pews. And while spiritual devotion is essential, according to the prophets, God isn't particularly interested in what we do in our sanctuaries. Check it out, Amos 5 and Micah 6. According to Matthew, through Jesus, God asks us for bread. Bread first. I was hungry and you gave me food. I can think of no more faithful task for 21st century disciples than baking bread, making pizza, and giving it away. I see that we've been given a new chance. As congregations are marginalized from mainstream culture, we can return to our roots, to, to the table, the, the kitchen, which is where Jesus began, with food for all, without condition. Come to a place where you are fed and known by name. I mean, here in this place, we have Marjorie and Anita and Norm, Lena, Zilka, Don, David, Jim, Hazel, a whole crowd. We've got Anjona and Benedict here. All are welcome and known. No more anonymous emails or no-name newsletters. When you give someone a slice of fresh homemade pizza, for example, you don't have to teach generosity or force gratitude. With shared food, it happens quite naturally. We sing our thanksgiving when we're fed and when we're welcomed. But don't take my word for it. See what you can do yourself. I'll bet you already do. Most United Church congregations are experts at doing food. so. Let's bake something fresh. A loaf of bread, some pizza, Scottish scones, sticky buns, oatmeal cookies, and then we give them away to strangers, unsuspecting and unsolicited, and see how they react. 
why don't we go out and get in trouble for giving things away? Why don't you buy the coffee for the person behind you in the Tim's takeout line? Or invite the nursing home care professionals to your church for a meal just to say thank you. The fire brigade down the street. No agenda. Just a way of saying we are grateful. I'll bet you have your own idea of a kitchen made gratitude. Who knows where it'll take us? Home baked gratitude. <laughs> Hot pizza does it every time. As I said as disciples, our role is to create a culture of thanksgiving, to live in a community that's governed by the spirit of generosity. So say it with me. No one goes away hungry. No one, no one goes, goes away, away hungry. hungry. No one goes away hungry. That's our motto here. You can talk about it, and you can write about it, you can preach and pray about it. But giving thanks happens best when real people with a real hunger are served real bread. And we all delight in God's grace. So if we were to run this in a workshop, that would be an opportunity then where we would sit and we would talk about ideas, because all of you have some now. You're thinking, oh, you know, and that's not saying don't do turkey suppers for sale. That's not what they said. This thing, think of the thing that you could give, that you could give away. I mean, we have a screen. We could play movies for free for people. There's no movie theater here. You, know, you never know. There's all kinds of ways that we could give back to this community and just say, we appreciate you. So if we decide to do this um, model that a smaller group of folks would come and listen to this video and then turn to one another and start to brainstorm ideas, that's stewardship. Sound good? So think about it if you want to do that. We'll talk about that during Lent, about thinking about what's coming next. So um, the invitation now is to let us bring... God our gifts, and that's in response to God's gracious love for each and every one of us. Let us bring God in our lives in response to Christ's call to serve others, and let us join together this morning in our morning offering. Our offerings have been received at the plates at the front in the back of the church. They will be received on the way out, and they will be received through donations made through our website, elmsdalecooperativeministry.com by email money transfers, pre-authorized remittance, all kinds of different ways. So you can find all of that under the Donate tab. I'll invite you guys to rise as we um, dedicate our offering in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you are never far from us. You are as close as our breathing. We recognize you as the one who heals the wounded spirit and gives new life to the brokenhearted. We offer these gifts to you, O God, as a sign of our commitment to your grace and authority. Take us and use us in all that we have, so that the kingdom of heaven will be realized on earth through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We come into a time of community prayer, our pastoral prayer. This week we especially hold our uh, friends at Bedford United Church in our thoughts. Their sanctuary was um, a victim of violence this week. Some of you would have seen on the CBC and their Black Lives Matter sign um, was vandalized. They had a brick thrown through their cross and collection plates were stolen and all because they've been receiving threats for having a Black Lives Matter poster in Bedford. This is the world we still live in. Let us also remember our community and the folks in our community, especially as we head in tomorrow to uh, Black History Month. And here in Nova Scotia, the uh, poster for this year is Black 
history matters. Um, I have a copy of our poster that will be coming to me and we'll have it in the narthex as well. And there'll be a moment in each of our services in February that helps us to remind ourselves of some black history here in our area. Um, so let us pray. Joining all the prayers of our hearts, community, family, friends, and ourselves. Most holy friend, savior of those who call on you, Please give us more of the compassion and authority of Jesus. Embolden us to heal the multiple diseases that afflict, human, afflict humanity and drive out the demons that afflict our contemporary world. Hear us, O God, loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your agents to, la to lands that lie under darkness and oppression. Where government is corrupt, justice is rare, abuse is endemic, and the weak and the poor have nowhere to turn for hope. Please increase the spiritual authority of groups like the Red Cross, Amnesty International, and groups that work with our own Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada. May they be more adequately ready to channel compassion, justice, practical aid, reconciliation, and peace. Hear us, O God. Loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your messages to situations where diseases like AIDS are reaping a grim harvest even through this COVID pandemic. Especially we pray for the afflicted nations on the contents or continents of Africa and Asia. Please give authority to people of disciplined compassion to provide pharmaceutical help, nursing care, better health education that will drive out the demons of superstition and fatalism. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your servants into places where food is scarce and crops are poor. Please strengthen the authority of those local leaders and outside advisors who seek to empower the people to conserve water, dig new wells, plant trees, grow new food, farm fish, start new cottage industries, and obtain better prices for their goods. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your human angels of mercy into situations both here and abroad, where there is neglect, illness, sorrow, frustration, and anger. Please give some of that compassionate authority of Jesus to chaplains in hospitals and prisons, to nurses and ambulance offices, physicians, servants, surgeons, social workers, and foster parents, police officers, and counselors. In this time, we pray specifically for all those affected directly or indirectly by this pandemic that has caused so much illness and death and has affected all of our lives. We pray for the spiritual, mental, and emotional, and physical health of all people everywhere. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your gifts of comfort and great joy among the many congregations of your churches, your temples, your mosques, your homes. May more of the spiritual authority of Jesus empower every ordinary member of our Christian church. And the wisdom and compassion of Christ enlarge the ministries of lay leaders and ordained ministers. By the grace of Christ, may our deeds more adequately match our creeds and our love expand to embrace those among us who appear lonely and unlovable. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. God, our most holy friend, in your mercy may we go from strength to strength in things of the Spirit and become the lovers and the agents of the holy awe, which is the beginning of true wisdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how to pray to you, saying, our Father, Mother, God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our sending music this morning will be one familiar to you. It's um, Christ has no body now, but.
but yours. But it's sung by um, a contemporary group um, and a group that gathered. There's a little information at the beginning of the video. It's really beautiful. Um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll close with our commissioning. Please enjoy this. Do you remember how the words go to the song that we did today? Place has no body but yours. Please rise for our commissioning benediction. Jesus comes to us, offering healing and hope 
speaking and acting with authority. Listen to him. Go into this world confident in God's love and healing power. Go in peace. And may God's love and peace be with each and every one of you now and always. Amen. We extinguish our candle now as a symbol that this service is over, this worship time. And our service in the world begins now. Go now in peace.